Hi, everyone. Merry Christmas, merry, merry time. We are a little delayed, but I am hoping that at the end of the full hour that you're going to say that was worth waiting for. And in this time of all of us up against the age of COVID and how horrible it is, we have to look for glimmers of light, love and peace wherever we can find them. And with me right now is my pal Chocolate, because tonight Fluffy decided to make it into a game, but he's here with us in spirit. And I wanted to start out in this holiday season where it is feeling so hard to even think it's Christmas, that there's good news in the environment. And right now in India, where four years ago it looked like the beautiful tiger population was headed for extinction. But now here is this joyous headline this week, quote, India's leopard population grows 60% since 2014, close quote. Coming back are the beautiful Indian leopards like this male up on this tree and the rare gorgeous snow leopards and the shy clouded leopards and the mysterious black leopards. As wonderful as this news is for the Indian leopards. Today, December 23rd, the UK Sky News had this breaking news, quote, COVID-19 second variant found in two coronavirus cases in the UK is highly concerning. The new variant is very different to a fresh strain found in the UK, but both appear to be more transmissible, an expert says, close quote. Both cases are people who traveled from South Africa over the last few weeks to the UK. It is thought the South African strain may be behind a record number of people being hospitalized with COVID-19 in that country now. And this has provoked immediate restrictions on travel from South Africa to the UK struggling to cope with a massive surge of COVID cases that also include a COVID mutation that is estimated to be 70% more infectious than the earlier COVID strains. As of today, December 23rd, at least 40 countries have banned or limited UK travel while medical scientists are studying the two new COVID mutations. The awful COVID coronavirus has now finally spread to every continent on Earth, including finally in Antarctica. Here is a tweet from the South Pole continent yesterday, December 22nd, 2020. Quote, COVID-19 has reached a research base in Antarctica. Until Monday, December 21st, Antarctica had been the only continent to remain free of the global COVID-19 outbreak. The Chilean army confirmed 36 positive cases among Chileans stationed at the O'Higgins base in Antarctica on Monday, including 26 military personnel and 10 civilians, close quote. And this aerial was taken by Dr. Eric Ding in work there in Antarctica. Now, last week, I presented my Zoom interview with Renan Shaked, the staff feature writer for Yadiyat Aranat in Tel Aviv, Israel. I talked with Renan about his newspaper interview with famous Israeli aerospace scientist, Haim Eshed, PhD, who has released a new book, The Universe Beyond the Horizon. The Tel Aviv newspaper published the book in early December, 2020 but only in Hebrew. There has been so much interest in the book that there might be an English edition in the future. But until then, I want to share with you tonight some of the Hebrew to English translation of the last important segment of the 232-page book. 
It's the epilogue entitled, We Are Not Alone. And the first Hebrew sentence of Professor Eshed's epilogue says, quote, In recent years, we've been exposed to information about phenomena which cannot be explained with existing physics, such as the appearance of unidentified flying objects or UFOs. The UFOs perform maneuvers that cannot be explained by existing human technology, close quote. That title, We Are Not Alone, at the end of this book is Professor Eshed declaring there is evidence of extraterrestrial vehicles, advanced technologies, alien bodies, dead or alive, and evidence of intelligent structures on Mars that he discusses, all alleged truths still kept from the public. I am able to do this epilogue book review with the help of Ido Shimoni, who is a cybersecurity professional working in Belgium. Ido was born 39 years ago in this small village outside Tel Aviv, and he is fluent in both Hebrew and English. Ido translated the entire epilogue from Hebrew to English that includes these words from the Greek genius Plato, quote, Astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us from this world to another, close quote. Professor Eshed begins with astronomer J. Allen Hynek's famous 1972 categories of human interactions with UFOs and ETs known as close encounters of the first, second, third, and fourth kinds. Now, a half century later, after Professor Hynek developed that category, Professor Eshed adds four more categories to Professor Hynek's 1972 list. Kind, where the UFO is observed on the ground after landing. The third kind are encounters of aliens who pilot the craft. The fourth kind, encounters of aliens in their craft due to kidnapping witnesses and bringing them to the aircraft for various examinations. And that means abduction. That's right. And the fifth kind is of dead bodies and autopsies of aliens. And this fifth is where Professor Eshed himself added his fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth to Professor Hynek's original list. All right. So translating from the book, it says, evidence provided by astronauts allows the use of another criteria and that is evidence for emergence of UFOs outside the Earth. And here are three more types of encounters. These would be sixth, seventh, and eighth. Right. So the sixth kind is the testimonies of astronauts in Earth orbit. The seventh kind, testimonies of astronauts of the Apollo program witnessing UFOs in the lunar skies. That is testimony of astronauts who would see unidentified aerial objects in the sky of our moon. That's correct. And the eighth kind is UFO photos taken elsewhere in the solar system, such as on planets like Mars. And we'll get to more on Mars in a few minutes. But now, let's go to where Professor Eshed goes into two UFO incidents. One is in the Grand Canyon of Arizona at a place called Comanche Point, and the next will be in Kiev, Ukraine. Right. Translating from the book, once the discovery is in the spring of 1994 in the Grand Canyon near Comanche Point, Arizona. The group of investigators called to investigate a strange craft lying in the bottom of the canyon it is 4,000 years old. Those who arrived at the scene were scientists with high security clarification. It turned out that the craft has an elliptical structure 50 feet wide and 16 feet long, and despite the crash, it is in good condition. It was made of extremely light metallic fibers, and the type of metal was not known. It emitted low energy levels 
and carbon tests have shown it has been stuck in the sands since 2000 BC. What is clear is that the source of the vehicle is extraterrestrial. The internal structure showed that the alien crew were human-like, short and oxygen breathing. The vehicle was operated by 12 to 20 alien beings. The power source of the craft was nuclear and the navigation system was magnetic. This craft had spaces for food and water. Tests showed that alien crew members left the spacecraft after landing and lived in the area for a few years. Information for these tests is found in the form of cave paintings in the area, showing figures of strange men with spherical heads. The implication of this Comanche Point case is that Southwest rock paintings could be linked to UFOs and ETs long ago. Indeed. Now let's go into the next one about a UFO investigation in Kiev, Ukraine. After World War II, following the evacuation of the ruins at a depth of 18 to 20 feet underground, a very strange craft was found. It was shaped like an arrow cylinder, 9 to 16 feet in diameter, a length of 16 to 19 feet, painted silver and with no seam lines at all. The back was torn from the craft. On the sides of the craft, they found various connections that gave it the shape of an arrow. The army was called to check what it was. The initial impression was a missile from a hostile country. Under a heavy cloak of secrecy, the craft was loaded onto a truck and taken to one of Moscow's suburbs named Podipki, an area now called Klingard. The test revealed it was between 3,000 to 5,000 years old. It turned out it was first discovered in the late 19th century, and those who found it tried to get it out of the ground but did not succeed. The governor of Kiev was ordered by the police and the authorities to inspect the object. The governor did not want to take any responsibility and ordered to bury it. From the tests by those who found it after World War II, it became clear that what was found was a section of the cockpit, which means that the researchers understood that it was an aircraft. The length of the craft originally was 11 to 12 feet. Unfortunately, the rear where the engine was supposed to be was not found. It was clear that the source of the vessel was not from Earth. Two seats were found in it, small ones, suitable for short people of four feet tall, as well as sophisticated equipment, which included control boards. The strangest thing was the captions found on the board and on the various controls. A linguistic inquiry has shown that the language is Sanskrit, ancient Sanskrit. It was clear that the source of the vessel was not from Earth. Let's go to another European UFO in Timmensdorf, Germany. In 1968, in Germany, near the border with the Soviet Union, near the Baltic Sea, a UFO was crashed. It was shaped like a disc, 100 feet in diameter. A third of it was stuck in the ground. Inside were 12 small bodies. They were photographed and identified in a gray color and were transferred for autopsies. Some did not appear to be able to reproduce. Autopsies showed that the bodies seem to have come out of a baking oven assembly line as a product of cloning. They did not have organs that could possibly belong to a digestive and excretion system, meaning they do not digest food as we know it. The UFO itself was dismantled into six parts and transferred to wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And this is really important because it is declaring that these were 12 small bodies that were definitely clones. And that has been a theme that has kept emerging in the 21st century more and more, that some of the alien interaction is not by organic prime intelligence, but by artificial intelligence in the shape and the form of small two to three to four foot bodies that seem to work for tall, organic, other intelligences. Let's go on to one of the most fascinating pieces of Professor Eschid's epilogue. That includes, with photos, 
on the planet Mars. Right. So this section uh, talks about three main photographs I will translate from the book. In this, I present a number of photographs from Mars, and no geological explanation can be given to them. It seems obvious that they were intentionally created by intelligent beings. The first one, a photograph taken by the lander Curiosity on August 19, 2016. In the center of the photo is a dark hill. The color of the hill is different from that of the ground. At the edge to the right is a section which seems unrelated to the flow of the hilltop. You see a round object at a magnification. You see a structure-like object or a fortress. Walls are straight. In the middle, a kind of a pit or a room. And this pit is quite large. An examination will show two things. The first is the mound itself. Its texture is not suitable for the texture of the soil. The ground is flat and rocky, and the mound is sandy. It seems to be stacked about 65 feet high. It is very dark in relation to the environment. The second thing is the fortress, or whatever it is, does not conform to the line rounding the continuum of the summit of the mound. The fortress was placed on the hill. The question arises as to why only on this side and not on the other side. The interior of the fortress is hollow and spacious, assuming it was built by someone, but for what purpose? If so, there should be some sort of entry into it. In the photo, you cannot spot it. Mars is windy, but even though the photograph, the photography is in black and white, there is no sign of dust accumulation, at least not in the place between the mound and the ground itself. This fact can imply that it's very young in geological time, maybe thousands of years old. Is this evidence of war that previously took place on Mars? And if after all it turns out that these are indeed artificial objects, then we have gained something new. What matters is the insight that we are not alone in the universe. Then new areas of research will open up, for example, archaeology of Mars. And perhaps future astronauts going out to Mars will have to be trained in archaeology. Now, talk to me about the three different photographs attached to Professor Eshed's epilogue. Right. So we've covered the first photo of the fortress. The second photo was taken by the Martian SUV Spirit on its 695th day of its activity. And in the photo, you can see a rock cut in its full width, as if a slice of rock had been removed from it and a kind of passageway had been formed. It cannot be formed as a result of the natural weathering of winds. For the creation of such cuts in the rock, tools are required. The third photo shows two experts that are magnified from a photo taken by the Mars SUV Curiosity on Sol 363 of its operation. The top picture shows a configuration somewhat reminiscent of a boat with a large hole in the center. On the left side of the object, you can see a kind of handle. In the second photograph, this object has the shape of a fish. These two objects, like several other objects, seem misplaced. How did they get there? Ido, as you look at that wide shot, Without knowing the distance from the camera or the size, they could be small in inches or maybe even in feet? Right. Unfortunately, the photos do not indicate the distance or the size of the object. So we can only guess here. It could be big or it could be tiny. But either way, when, at least when you look at, at, the, at the top picture, for me... Seeing that round hole in the middle seems a bit artificial. Until reading Ido Shimoni's translation of the Hebrew to the English of Professor Eshed's epilogue, that I never knew, I had never heard, that 12 alien bodies classified as clones had been found in Germany in 1968. 
And there had been uh, at least other reports of clones over the last 70 years, almost going all the way back before World War II. But the German story means that these 12 small beings that were retrieved from a UFO were technically cloned androids. And that concept of alien clones came up as early as the 1941 Cape Girardeau, Missouri crash, in which three identical humanoid bodies were described being found in that crash. And later, there is a report that they were determined to be clones, identical, manufactured as described by Professor Eschid in his epilogue of his new book, The Universe Beyond the Horizon. Now, I can hear authorities, military, government, political, I can hear them say, if those are clones, where are the ones that made the clones? That question might have been haunting the United States government since at least 1941, and the more clone bodies were found, the more nervous authorities would be until they could finally meet the clone makers. The implication from Professor Eschid's book and from my discussions with Spartan 1 and 2 and other whistleblowers leads to revelations that Earth humans are in collaboration with some non-humans in interstellar trade operations, and those non-humans are supposed to be friendly to Homo sapiens sapien. But it is Professor Haim Eshed himself who told Tel Aviv writer Renan Shaked earlier this month that, quote, the aliens have asked not to announce that they are here. Humanity is not ready yet, close quote. I truly think that we are ready. I truly think that the human Homo sapiens sapiens species deserves the truth. The fact that there are power breaker brokers and people in politics and in governments and in military and in religions around this planet who know that we are not alone who know that there is active interaction with other intelligences perhaps for 270 million years and that we are not to be told because it would cause the stock market to fall. That's not an excuse. I don't think we're going to make it out of the 21st century as a viable planet if we are not told the whole truth and that all of humanity begins to have the right to the same kind of understanding and knowledge as the people who allegedly run this planet, whether they are non-human or human or a collaboration of both. Last week, with so many questions of what is coming next in the age of COVID and from what direction will there be danger I read to you a brief email about a Spanish YouTube channel in Norway that had an interview about an alert to all citizens to prepare for an emergency with supplies for three days. The emailer asked me what was going to happen. And I put that out as a question to all of you a week ago, and I want to thank the dozens of you, I never made a total count, there might have been a hundred, who sent me information about this pamphlet that the Norwegian government sends to all citizens with advice on emergency preparedness. On the front, it goes and says, you are a part of Norway's emergency preparedness, advice on emergency preparedness. And when you turn to the next page, it says, meaning Norway, we are the safest country in the world, yet we are vulnerable. The same could be said for every single nation on the planet. When you turn to the third page, it has 20 uh, line items of what you should have for emergency storage. It begins with nine liters of water, about 2.2 gallons, so that 
any person who might be uh, quarantined or stuck or something is happening for at least three days, they would have these 20 line items to make sure that they always had them in their home, in their house, in their garage to get through an emergency. It is a great idea. It would probably be wonderful if every country on the planet sent out every year emergency preparedness list. But I think this is what was behind the question last week because it was from a person who was listening to a Spanish program about three-day preparedness for emergency. And so for now, let's just say Norway is doing a beautiful job in putting out 12 pages. They really are intelligent and that the rest of the world should do that as well. And I wanted you to all know this week, we did break through 158,000 subscribers. And I hope that those of you who have not subscribed yet, that you will hit those red subscription buttons on your screen so that we can all gather on the spring equinox in March of 2021. It's about three months from now, believe it or not, three and a half. And the idea is for us to celebrate again the Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast and have 175,000 subscribers around the world with all of your help. I know that we can do this. So tonight, if you haven't subscribed yet, please click on the red subscription button on your screen, usually in the lower right or upper right, I think. And I want you to feel a huge digital hug right now for tonight, for the holidays, in this miserable age of COVID that we find some kind of warmth in being able to share about information that is being denied us, but that we are still doing this at the Earth Files YouTube channel. And we have also gathered together some interview highlights from my nearly now 150 Earth Files YouTube channel broadcasts since the end of 2017. And tonight, for the first time, we are introducing interview highlights in a playlist at the Earth Files YouTube channel homepage. You go to youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Earth Files. The new Linda Moulton Howe Earth Files interview highlights are the second playlist on that homepage. The average running time is 10 minutes. So hopefully these highlights will help all of you to catch up with some of the extraordinary firsthand information from military whistleblowers and others about the high strangeness on our planet. And I have that special report that I've done tonight and there will be others coming in the new year. But now, Brad and I wanted to give you a visual gift. As the light of the great planet Saturn and Jupiter were moving closer and closer to each other the past few weeks, Brad began photographing on December 13th, and I took photos on December 19th. There was an eerie expectation as the planets moved closer and closer each night, finally moving to only point one degree separation on Monday night this week, December 21st after sunset. And that's when the two planets finally appeared as one vivid star, not far from the western horizon. That is what is known as the Great Conjunction. The light of those two planets that close in the night sky has not been seen since 1226 nearly 800 years ago. But physically, those big planets were 456 million miles apart. That was also the beginning of shorter nights moving toward more light as we hit the winter solstice. And I would like all of you to try to hang on with me tonight. The sense of wonder of the light of those two large planets 
coming together slowly, slowly, night by night, and how many of us went out to take photographs in wonder and to hang on to this winter of profound discontent with COVID that we can remember some of these moments that remind us how long cycles in this universe, in this solar system, in this planet, continue. And what we would like you to do is now to watch some of our images with hope that the new year will be better for everyone. Q&A next, Peggy. But I'm ready. And you know what? That last photograph that looks almost like a watercolor, it was the last shot on the 19th where I thought, I'm just going to try one more shot through the lace of those trees and see if I can make my uh, cell phone go in in a zoom. And it seems so out of focus. And I thought, it's a lost shot. And now I think it is one of the most beautiful images and again, almost reinforcing that when we think that we have lost, that we are down, that we can't go any further, especially in this age of COVID, that when you just make a try without even knowing what's going to happen on the other end, but just try, hang on, change the frequency, move forward. Sometimes miracles kind of happen. So I love you guys. Thank you for being here with me on these Wednesday nights. It means everything. And right now to Peggy with comments and your questions. Hi, Linda. First, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for their super chats. To anybody watching as well, our super chats are donations made during the live broadcast within our chat window. I'd like to thank Jenna McHugh, Jeffrey Rizzo, TNC, Vicki Martinez, Sexy Sadie, Dr. Dolores Mize, Justin C., Karma Vixen, Academic Art, Natalie Bergman, Emily R., Celissa Rominski, Jerry Tobias, Chris Young, Isabella Pacchetti, Christy Zimmerman, Jared Pemberton, Cat Chaser, Vilma, Rebecca Cole, Travel Time Lily, Kendall 190, Alex Tam, Vegan Tattoo, Leo Zabo, Leslie Odom, Miss Pumpkin Kitty, Leon Brown, Stan Kalowski, Justin C., Dara and Judy Graham. Thank you, everyone. And you guys give Peggy an ovation. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic, Peggy. And thank you all so much. Let's try to generate in our mind, our body, and our spirit the most positive frequencies that we can to blast away uh, the energy that is surrounding the earth and the terrible COVID and that we're going to get past this and hopefully vaccinations are going to help us. And with that, what do we have as the first comment or question? Uh, a viewer was wondering, what do you think the end game is uh, with the ETs that Dr. Ashid is speaking about? Professor Ashid went into the issue in Arizona, in Comanche, 
point uh, in Germany. Uh, so a wide range here without really any details except in that first specific in Comanche Point said that when they did the autopsies that they were gray color. Uh, didn't talk about them being clones, but talked about them being a gray skin and sort of human-like and breathe. I don't know how they determined that unless it was hemoglobin. And if it was hemoglobin, as we know, when it said that they uh, breathed air, um, I jumped to, well, then were they hybrids? Were they part human and part grays? Or... Uh, we have this huge gap in having detailed knowledge about what government and military autopsies have learned about all these bodies going back to 1941, the earliest that I know about in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And so they're not giving of, in Professor Eshed's epilogue, which is the only part of the book that goes into all of these kinds of details. Uh, it isn't like you're being given illustrations or breaking down being by being. He talks about, uh, from the reports, reinforcing clearly that he thinks that these details in the cases that he puts in his epilogue are legitimate to share with the public. And then you back away from that and you have to assume that he has chosen cases that he has had some discussion with somebody about. So I would say that Comanche Point would probably be the Greys, uh, but the thing that's peculiar there is when he said that they were uh, air breathing or oxygen breathing. The ones in Germany, uh, outside of being clones or not broken down, you know, tremendously. Uh, and then we were uh, the, the third location. It did not give a detailed description either of the type. But these are the questions, it seems to me, that a lot of answers are lying in all kinds of documentation, medical autopsy reports, and have been for decades. And we're if you go back to when the war ended in 1945, we're going back 70 years. And it's very clear, I could think Cape Girardeau in 1941 was a real case with clones. And that means that the leaders of this country, whoever have been brought into the Majestic 12, highly classified, above top secret, all of it, uh, they would have had big discussions about finding identical clones and who would have the technology to do that. In my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, um, there is a huge chapter. I believe it's 106 pages. And it goes in to cloning technology. That's what it's about. But I wrote that book in the 1990s and there had not been as much discussion about clones then as there have been in the last five to ten years as more and more uh, documents have surfaced. So you take at least 70 years and you realize that getting to the bottom of who has the cloning technology, how are they doing it, why are they doing it, that that would have been a, a driving issue. Now, there is one abduction case that comes to mind where I remember that the human was saying to a tall gray, uh, assuming a, a prime intelligence and organic, uh, very tall, um, do you, this was the question, it was during my, all of my animal mutilation investigations, the human is saying to the tall gray, are you the ones that do the animal mutilations? And the answer that came back telepathically, well, you all on earth are not as advanced as we are. 
And when you reach a certain level of advancement, you make robots to do your work throughout the universe. That was actually in a transcript going back to the end of the 80s, the early 90s, about this, um, the whole issue of which non-humans with which agendas are in control and who is serving them and what is the relationship between all of them to planet Earth as a laboratory and interacting with us. Those are the issues that I sure would like to be able to present here at the Earth Files YouTube channel in another year or two, I hope, with some breakdown that we have finally gotten that headline, we're not alone in the universe, and we all begin to be told the truth. It's confusing that Professor Eshed's own quote in the article in Tel Aviv was, that it was the non-humans who did not want humans to be told that they were here interacting. That is confusing. But I just think we go for what is truth for humans. So on to another question, Peggy. A viewer would like to know, have you had any sources tell you to expect more videos to be released from the government anytime soon? The rumors are coming all of the time that there is supposed to be the release of something in February. Um, and we have been getting the releases of the FLIR and military and, and uh, jet film. Um, the problem is that showing advanced technology and having one military person say, well, I know for a fact that that Tic Tac was AI, artificial intelligence. And we know that the ETs do have all kinds of uh, objects that have, can be in the sky and can go 15,000 miles an hour and stop, stop on a dime and do a 90 degree turn. Humans would not survive that. Um, I think our fastest uh, Mach is, is getting about Mach 10. I think that's seven, we're going about 7,000 or 8,000 miles an hour in an advanced plane. That's not 15,000 miles an hour. Uh, and a human body would not be able to survive those inertial forces. So it's a different technology. But if the entire plane is artificial intelligence, and has neither clones nor the progenitor races or anything, it's just the whole machine is the intelligence. That is, as I understand, part of what the alien world works in. And then there are the advanced craft, which are also like life forms is the way it's described, but they will have pilots but the pilots can be cloned and made specifically for those sort of life form craft. And then there's another category apparently of very large, where perhaps the, uh, we'll call it the clone makers, the advanced intelligences are on board. Uh, this is speculation, not proved, but um, that, that is the landscape in which these headlines or emails or tweets surface and say, just wait, we're going to have a mind blower in February. Well, if it continues to be intel like technical uh, uh, technology, without bringing into it the context of what do we know now as human governments, political systems, scientists, doctors, about the intelligence behind these technologies, it seems to me it's kind of hollow. But I am for confirming, that's the way I look at it, disclosure happened in Roswell 
1947. Those, that was disclosure. Flying disc crashes on ranch near Corona. That was disclosure. What we've been waiting for ever since then is confirmation by our government and other governments that know fair well that they have retrieved bodies and advanced technologies and propulsion systems, and there have been efforts to weaponize some of the things that have been uh, retrieved from craft. So now, today, as we are getting ready to have Elon Musk allegedly launch, perhaps in 2024, to Mars and join up with a public cover <laughs> that what has been an underground base there of collaboration between human astronauts and non-humans in that underground lava uh, to base that Professor Eschid has described, that the man who worked at White Sands Missile Range I've told you about came to see me in 1988 in Denver and told me about that. The disconnect between what is real, how much there is underground, how much there already is known out in the solar system, the uh, going into the uh, interstellar trade routes that go throughout the Milky Way galaxy, I have no doubt whatsoever it's all happening. And yet our planet is kind of kept in a dark age about everything that's happening that's exciting. And why? If it were all good news, I think we would be told. But if we live on a planet where the power brokers are the ones that decide what we as a civilization are to know or not know about what's going on on our planet, the solar system and the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda and beyond, there are trillions of galaxies. Something is really, really wrong about the control structure that is now in control of the truth about we are not alone in this universe. And as Professor Eschet used those words in what I've read of the translation in his book, there are many, many humans on Earth that are actively work looking with and using technologies to look for consciousness, conscious life in this universe. That was one of his sentences. I thought it was a, a perfect underscore. The life forms could come in a bell-shaped curve of so many, but consciousness with intelligence, with intent, that's what we need to understand more about friendly, neutral, unfriendly, and grow up on this planet a whole lot more without having to wait for people to go to Mars, be in an underground lava tube that already has been a base since at least 1972, and then start coming or sending information back to Earth. Oh, well, ETs have showed up there. Maybe that's what they thought that they could do, but there's just too many other reports from reliable people. And to me, it's unfair to be in this huge disconnect. His photos, Professor Eschid's choice of those Martian photos to put in his book, there are not many photos, he chose those. That round fortress, it's clearly something constructed. The other from afar that might be small or larger, depending if you knew anything about uh, the altitude and the distance. But again, there is what appears to be a perfect hole in whatever that elongated thing is. And that Professor Eschid is showing it and saying these appear to be artificial structures. And the place is Mars. So it's like we're baby stepping up to 
finally somebody who has all of the details, knows everything about all of the bodies, all of the retrievals, all of the telepathically communicating beings, who they are, which are friendly, neutral, unfriendly, which ones are the primary uh, life forms that have created all of the artificial intelligence. I can't imagine anybody arguing, oh, humans will be afraid and collapse. Clearly that hasn't happened in the military and the government structures that were evolving with the discoveries of all of these places. So uh, I opt for saying, let's tell the truth about all of this. Let's see, I'll take one more, one more question. Oh. One of the viewers want to know, are there aliens living among us who don't know that they're aliens? I think there is definitely evidence of non-human intelligences living on this earth right now. I think that even Professor Eshed in the translations implies that there are have been or are other intelligences who have interacted on the surface of this planet for thousands of years, may be the ones responsible for the genetic manipulation of humans, that there have been others that have lived in bases underground on this planet for perhaps millions of years. And then there is the question, if there are hybrids, and I think without question there are. Barbara Lamb, a very good friend of mine, has been doing hypnotherapy for decades and says, and was a co-author on the book, Meet the Hybrids, people who have either memories or dreams or uh, the book is full. They look human, but they are the ones who say that they have memories or dreams of another life, another place, uh, other intelligences. So it's, uh, it's more ephemeral in terms of somebody can say, I'm a hybrid. Now let's go on to what I know exists and exists in some very uh, credible universities and laboratories, that there is evidence for unusual genetic material that might be related to a hybrid. That is not the same sentence as saying that we have definitive proof of human extraterrestrial hybrids moving among us. It's not proof, it's indications coming from a bunch of directions that include laboratory rumors, and then the people themselves who have gone to someone like Barbara Lamb, and she did the co-authoring on the book, and you begin to look at the huge human population, and it seems to me that when you go from documents that I have read right here at Kirtland Air Force Base back in 1983, these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien sapien. It's in the context of a briefing paper for a president of the United States, and that is not the only place or the only source that I have seen a similar sense. So let's say that's the big truth. You all can tell me is absolute stand up in a court of law, biological evidence, government testimony, documents, photographs, videotapes, old films, all having to do with extraterrestrial biological entities that fit that sentence. Is that something we should not know? 
Is that something that would terrify you, make you want to run to a corner? That ETs of some sort are the ones responsible for the evolution from Homo erectus to Cro-Magnon, Homo sapien, sapien, and all the models in between. It doesn't bother me at all. It just makes me want to know more and more about the advanced intelligences that have used our planet as a laboratory and we exist. And there is something about us that is extraordinary and I think it's our souls. And I think that those that have tweaked and manipulated the genetic evolution, they know that there is something extraordinary in the Homo sapiens sapien model. So on this night before Christmas Eve, before Christmas, Let's all think about the soul that inhabits our mind, our body, and our spirit. And that if we knew the whole truth, we might be the only life form spirit, the life form experiment that ended up in this vast cosmos with souls so special that they could retain life after life after life of knowledge and recycle it back to the divine field in an ever-expanding, huge cosmic fabric. It is that cosmic fabric that Professor Haim Eshed, in his book, provokes anyone looking at the translations to want to know more about this universe and our relationship to it because I think we are all contributing to that huge cosmic fabric in every generation of life. And in a way, that's what is behind Christmas. I love you guys. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. Select a language and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.